Job chapter 32, beginning at verse 1. Brother Charlie. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Job chapter 32. Job chapter 32. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Berachel, the Buzite of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was the wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. Also against his three friends was his wrath kindled because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Now Elihu had waited till Job had spoken because they were elder than he. When Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, then his wrath was kindled. And Elihu, the son of Berachel, the Buzite, answered and said, I am young, and ye are very old. Wherefore, I was afraid, and durst not show you mine opinion. I said, Days should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty given them understanding. Great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. Therefore I said, hearken to me, I also shall show you my opinion. Behold, I waited for your words, I gave ear to your reasons, whilst ye searched out what to say. Yea, I attended unto you, and behold, there was none of you that convinced Job, or that answered his words. Lest ye should say, we have found out wisdom, God thrusteth us him down, not man. Now he hath not directed his words against me, neither will I answer him with your speeches. They were amazed. They answered no more. They left off speaking. When I had waited, for they spake not, but stood still and answered no more. I said, I will answer all my part. I also shall show mine opinion, for I am full of matter. The spirit within the constraineth me. Behold, my belly is as wine which hath no vent. It is ready to burst like new bottles. I will speak that I may be refreshed. I will open my lips and answer. Let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person. Neither let me give flattering titles unto men. For I know not to give flattering titles. In so doing, my maker would soon take me away. Amen. Before we enter into the uh, word of God this morning, let's take this time to ask God's blessing on it and that he would be instrumental through his Holy Spirit to enlighten our hearts to receive his scriptures. Thank you, Father, that we have the word of God today. Thank you that you brought us all here and whatever it is that you have in store for us may not even be part of the sermon itself, but yet in very uh, special ways, we know that you're able to use the scripture and the, the stories and the individuals and things that are said in intentional ways on your part to make a, a, an impact upon a life. So, Lord, we commit the sermon to you. Thank you for the gift of hearing, for language, for words, and all the things that make it possible for us now today to be able to preach a sermon and receive it as the word from God himself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when we take and we look at this passage of scripture, we're at a point in uh, the, of the discourse or the poem as some have called it, whereby there is a somewhat of a conclusion reached. And the conclusion is we don't have a conclusion. And the reason for that is that it, it's one of those situations that, um, let me go back one slide here. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, there we go. The reason that we, they could not reach a conclusion is because they were debating the age-old dilemmas that have surrounded humanity. And those three dilemmas that are, are very familiar to us and existed during the time of, of Job and his three counselors and was this, that the first off would be the motive of believers to God's goodness, the problem of believers' suffering, and the problem of the limited knowledge of God in his providential dealings with mankind. When you go to the first one, 
is, uh, and what I'm doing is giving you a background here because this entire book orbits around this issue. That's why we reached kind of like a, a irresolvable uh, uh, problem. There's a tension that arises here. But for the purposes of how, why all this is happening is because in Job 1.9, the question was asked by Satan, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan was questioning the motive of God. And so the motive of believers to God's goodness oftentimes arises in, in theological circles. Why do we do what we do? Are we doing it because of the, the promise of eternal rewards? And if that were theory were to be tested, how would we manage a struggle and the difficulties of life? In this particular case, Job is the test case of that uh, theory from, uh, from Satan. And it's a matter of the question of motives. It's a trial. Job is going to rest on the matter of grace, the unmerited favor of God that he had given out to Job. And so with that, could man maintain his integrity before God on the platform of grace and not upon the platform of merit and rewards? And that's a, that's a question that oftentimes we, we have to ask ourselves. This was the issue uh, with Job, and so he is the test case. And Satan is using him to, whether to prove or disprove that God said, you test him and he'll stay with me because he's not doing this because of the things that I've given to him. He's a man of integrity. Satan says, I have a better way. I think he's doing this because you have blessed him. Secondly, the other uh, problem that uh, we all struggle with, and that is the problem of believers suffering. Why do good people happen? Why do evil things happen to God's people? How can a good God allow suffering? And why do the righteous suffer? You, you can list the questions. They go on and on. And, the, the, and here again, this is the, the issue that Job is trying to resolve and explain from his perspective, his position, and then his counselors also are arguing against him. They have their theories. But in the end, when we get to the end of chapter 31, and we read these words, and, uh, or excuse me, yeah, chapter 31 at the very end, let the thistles grow instead of wheat and the cockle instead of barley, the words of Job are ended. That's the end of the story. And, and so we're left with another unresolved dilemma. The third dilemma in a life that this story orbits around is the problem of limited knowledge about God's providence. How do we explain this? Job tried. His counselors tried. And kind of like as a, a little side thought here, you have this young man that is sitting off to the side listening to all of these theological debates and this discussion. But some of the explanations that have been given over the years are about as, as, uh, uh, as many as there are writers that have something to say about the subject. So there's, there's no lack of information on how, why God does what he does. Some are more definitive than others. Some are simple, some are complex. But in the end, and by the end of the day, nobody seems to have the absolute answer. Why? Because you're dealing with finite minds trying to understand an infinite God. And his ways are not our ways. But nevertheless, as Job is sitting there suffering and his counselors are trying to explain to him why he's suffering, Job, on the other hand, is responding by saying, listen, this, the situation the way it is because God can do this, but yet... He couldn't resolve that thing in his own mind. And so we have this debate that has taken place. And by the time we get to verse 30, uh, chapter 32 and verse 1, these men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. They, they stopped. They, 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 there was nothing more that they could say. They could not convince Job of, of their theories concerning God and suffering. And Job had lettered, uh, uttered his last words according to his way of thinking. So what do we have? We have a stalemate. We have a gridlock. And if for the writer of uh, the book of Job were to just end it there, we would be left with no solution to this age-old question of suffering and evil. And, but yet God in his mercy for the sake of Job primarily, and for the benefit of his counselors so that they could get a better education on God, God introduces Elihu into the story. 
And so we have the context of the book. There is the drama that is taking place that took place when there was a righteous man that, hated, that loved uh, God and hated evil. And then we have uh, Satan and uh, his meeting with God. Job is plagued. Job is uh, desperate. His wife gives the impression that she is going to abandon him. And then after 14 days, his friends arise, probably business associates from other parts of the country, and they endeavor to try to explain to Job why all this is taking place. And they were moralists. They had small minds about God. They basically said this, you are the way you are because apparently you have sinned. God judges sinners, and he does it in his own way of doing things. Job says, yeah, people do are, are judged by, because of sin. But then there are evil people that are never judged by sin, so what are you going to do about that? And so this debate goes on and on for approximately 30 chapters. And we're, we're now at the situation with that we have this tension, and with every story, you have a drama, and a good writer creates a tension, and, and, and you're waiting for a resolution. How can we end it? How can we resolve uh, the characters some way or uh, somehow that we leave satisfied and settled that the story is over? And the scriptures are written much in that same way, and such is the case here. Elihu is brought in as the one that is going to now bring a resolution to this tension between the counselors of Job and Job himself. He's going to clear this theological air. He's going to help remove the fog that was from around their minds concerning how God works with people, whether they're righteous or sinners, and he's going to be of a great asset with words of grace and wisdom on behalf of Job. So with all of that in the background and this dilemma of sin and suffering, we, we now bring into the scene Elihu, and he occupies approximately uh, four chapters in the balance of the book. But I want you to notice something that we gain a little bit of insight about Elihu and what did what he had to say, was it really worthwhile? Did he say anything different than the previous three friends? So you go to the end of the book, chapter 42, when God now is going to speak with Job, and we begin at verse 7. And these two verses say give us uh, something interesting of God's thoughts to the three friends in Elihu. Notice what? And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said unto Eliphaz, the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against his two friends, for they have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job has. Therefore, this is what he tells them to do, and these are the things that they were supposed to do, and that was the sacrifice. But I want you to notice, Elihu's name is not mentioned. God's wrath is not against Elihu. And the... the the difference is to this, the thing that is right. What these men said to Job in verse 2, their two friends, you and your two friends, have not spoken of me the thing that is right. And I want you to also notice that God's anger was kindled against these three men. That sort of sets the context. It sets the stage. Because now when Elihu speaks, one of the primary characteristics of Elihu is the fact that his anger, his wrath, is kindled against these three men. So God and Elihu have something in common. Both of them are, shall we say, extremely frustrated, but better yet, they are angry because that neither one of them, the three men, nor Job himself, spoke that which was right about God. That is the part that makes all the difference in the world. The men did not have a high view of God. What they had to say about God was made of their own contrivance. They, they made things that would fit for their argument, but were not necessarily drawing down from their uh, form of inspiration and knowledge that they had of God himself. Elihu speaks differently. He enters into the scene, and he's going to speak the words that elevate God to a higher platform. And his, he comes in as the fourth counselor. And I want you to notice something as we begin to, on this journey. Elihu has a different counseling style because of his high view of God than his three friends would ever have. And so they were being re-educated, Job, is being encouraged by what he has to say. So the men could not have convinced Job. There was nothing that they could do that it would explain the situation. And Job himself 
could not convince them of his position on this matter of sin and suffering, the righteousness of God, living by God's grace, and still having true motives in the, the whole thing. So as we move forward, we break it down into two very simple parts. But, and I don't want to oversimplify it. I want you to capture the mind that we're listening to the words of Elihu. Elihu has something to say. So from him, there, he's notice his background. He's anger, he's anger. There's wrath against these men. But yet, he is going to provide Job with words of grace. So the first part is this. Concerning Elihu, there's a prevailing conviction that provides occasion for the words of grace. The convictions that he had would allow him the opportunity to present to Job words of grace that would see him through this. Let's, let's remember that our servant is worn out. He's lost much of his family, all of his real estate, all of his stock holdings, all of his farming industry. Now his health is ruined. Not only that, he... He had a very short discussion with his wife at the very beginning. The very uh, partner of his life, his soulmate, says, curse God and die. Three business partners show up who have a, a, an attitude that we are God's sent theologians to help you understand this. And now he has to argue with them. I think if any one of us had to go through that kind of ordeal, we probably would be ready to throw in the towel and, and just give it up. Because nobody's winning. We're at a gridlock. We're at a stalemate. But yet Elihu, with his convictions, then we enter in, and we, the second part is going to be that of God. God in his providential care that provides grace to help in time of need. It's no accident that Elihu is off to the side, unheard of, never mentioned. We don't know anything about him until chapter 32. And it's because I believe it's at the climax of Job's life. Right now, the, with the misery and the illness and the time that he's going through, such ends the words of Job. He closes it. But then God ushers in this very faithful man of God that had a high view of God, that understood God, understood in a way that didn't necessarily answer the problem, but he provides him a way of escape. And that's the difference between Elihu and his three friends. So Elihu provides to Job the words of grace at the right time, God provides Job the messenger of grace at the right time. And trust me, in our lives, we need both. We need the times and the occasion when the words of grace and help and, and mercy come to us either from the scripture or by a faithful servant who responds to the prompting of God, go see so-and-so, or you may be in a conversation and God engages your mind in that individual. So you need both. You'll not be able to endure any hardship or any trial without the Scripture, the Holy Spirit, and a messenger from God, as it was in Job's case. So here's this worn-out servant, and now uh, he has the comfort of Elihu, a very, very good, faithful friend. So what do we find? Well, we, we find the parallel thoughts of the anger. That's a very important part of the passage. In verse 32, and his anger was kindled, the wrath of Elihu, the son of, of Bakshel, the Beelzeite, and kindled a ram against Job, and was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. Also, against his three friends was his wrath kindled because they had found no answer, yet had condemned Job. Now, it's, he's, he's angry because they abused God. They did not provide a suitable answer. I believe in Elihu's heart, he's, he's sitting there, and you could just almost imagine a, a, a large tent, and they're meeting with Job. He's not going to be necessarily sitting outside in his large tent. He's suffering, and, here, and we have the camels outside, and we have this meeting place, and these three aged men come up, and they're telling Job all about life and how to understand all this. Elihu's just sitting back there saying, wrong, wrong. I, gotta, I can't say it. But yet, what's bothering him is not the fact that there was an age difference that would prohibit him from speaking. What really gets to him is the fact that they misrepresented Job. They did not provide the right answer. It's not that their answer was just anything. They failed to provide the right answer. And Elihu, being a man that had a high view and understanding of who God is, 
he could see that this is not being true to Jehovah. Even in that time in which we lived, which was probably times either before Abraham or during the time of Abraham is where this account arises out of the scripture. That's his, it's historical setting. So the, Elihu was a man of convictions. There were three convictions that he had. And these convictions were powerful. These convictions would restrain his anger. And his anger is because of a misrepresentation of the Most High God. And it failed to answer Job. Job needed Most High God answers, and they failed to do it. And these convictions are three. A binding respect for his elders, the, the wisdom of listening before you speak, and true wisdom comes from God and not from man. Listen to the words that he gives to us. When you look at the first one, the binding respect for his elders in verses 4 to 6. Now Elihu waited until Job had spoken because they were elder than he. When Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, his wrath was kindled. And Elihu, the son of Barakchel, the Buzzite, answered and said, I am young and afraid. You are very old. Wherefore, I was afraid and dare not show you my opinion. He understood from his traditional oral teaching from parents and grandparents and a cultural background that was there. If you're young and you're sitting with a group of aged men, you keep your lips zipped. No matter what you think you have to say, there's a time and a place to say it, but the first thing is you demonstrate respect for your elders, a long lost art. And it's something that needs to be revisited. It is something that can help temper and control passions in any one of us, and especially in the younger generation. Everybody's got to blog it, blurb it, spit it out, speak our mind, and say what we think, contrary even to these days back in the days of Abraham. But what it did for Elihu, it reserved in the, to the time, the proper time, the right occasion, that because his anger was restrained by a conviction that says, wait until you are given the opportunity, then speak. Then he could speak accurately. He could speak carefully. He could speak to Job as a friend and could see the hurt and the pain that he was in. Rather than venting, as he describes himself in verse uh, 19, my belly is as wine which has no vent and ready to burst like new bottles. That's how much he had within him. He was constrained to speak, but a conviction that there are certain manners that must be upheld and maintained, and he did that. His second conviction was the fact that there's wisdom in the listening before you speak. There's wisdom in listening. Proverbs 18, 13 tells us this, that he that answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame unto him. Short version, don't be a know-it-all. George Washington, in his book of mannerisms, that is in a little thin book that you can get online from wallbuilders.com, I think there are like 35 or 40 uh, uh, quotes or sayings by George Washington on manners. And one of, the, uh, one of them is most interesting in the, in the times in which we live, uh, that we have the answer because we got it off of Google, Wikipedia, or some other means of uh, the information highway, is this when people are sick and they're in the hospital, don't be their doctor. It's just really quick. Cool. Now, that's rather interesting because we have a cure for everything. We can go to home care. We can go to health care. We can go to herbal care. We can go to herbal life. We can go to natural herbs and oils. There's all kinds of things. We have the answer. And really, George Washington in his day said, listen, those kind of things, you keep that to yourself. You're not the doctor. They are men that were trained. He mentions other things, such as uh, being, being respectful when somebody else is speaking. You, you, you don't get very close to them. You keep a distance so you don't spit in their face. <laughs> That's it. And then uh, taking your shoes off and going into a house. Uh, proper names of identification. So, so Washington had these things in his book of mannerism. And here it is with Elihu. He says, listen. Uh, I'm not going to answer until I hear the whole story. I'd imagine his chain was jerked right at the very beginning when they started to skew the testimony of God. And with his understanding of, of God, he, he had something to say about it. But instead, he's just taking mental notes and he's holding it. Why? Because a wise man hears the whole story before he gives an answer. 
He was not going to interrupt. He could not interrupt because he understood the, the platform of elders and younger. Youngers do not address down the elders, although the opportunity was given to him and he took advantage of it. So it's not like you never do it. He waited until the proper time. He listened to their entire report. We, we've got to be able to capture this. Just in, just in general life, get the whole story before we reach a conclusion. Elihu gives us the best living example under the worst of conditions to be able to do such a thing. His third conviction that he had is that true wisdom comes from God and it's not by age and experience. Look at verses seven to nine. And I said, days should speak, a multitude of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty gives them understanding. Great men are not always wise, neither do the age understand judgment. Well, that's interesting. He's talking to the older men in a very respectful way. He's simply saying, I understand you guys have years of experience, and they would. And he's not saying, do not listen to aged experience and, uh, the, and of men and women who have been there and have done that. But what he is saying, you do not necessarily use that experience as the absolute in life. It's not the absolute. God gives wisdom. So as he lays the two side by side, knowledge with experience is good. It has its place. But God gives the wisdom. So in verse 9, great men are not always wise, neither do they understand judgment. Why? Because in verse 8, there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty gives them understanding. Now we'll flesh that little phrase out there later on. Basically it's saying this, because they did not have uh, the full counsel of God and all of the scripture in their possessions, they had no writing of the word of God in their possession. God would speak to these men in those times directly, either uh, as it was with Abraham, and the Lord spake unto Abraham, and, and then to Joseph as in a dream, and so the ways in which God would speak to his people. Elihu understood that and simply gives it to it in one classification. There is a spirit in man, and the uh, inspiration of the Almighty gives them understanding. So those three convictions. Those three convictions, because they helped restrain his anger, gave him the opportunity to be able to give words of grace to this man, Job, and to his three friends. Not only did he have that kind of conviction, but he was able to offer consolation. He had words of consolation. When you look at uh, the chapter 33, we're going to kind of like go through this like a, a flat stone over the top of a lake, but yet each time the stone touches the water, there is there's a, a lesson to be learned for us here. We're going to fast forward to verse 13 of chapter 33, and as and it's very respectful, but yet something that had to be said, and that is this. Why dost thou strive against him? For he gives not an account of any of his matters. In a very kind and a patient way, Elihu is simply saying this. It's not for us to tell God, give me the explanation. God doesn't have to. And he's, he's helping Job to be humble, waiting for the right answer. There's more to come. But both his three friends and Job himself tried to speak for God, tried to explain why God was doing things. And Elihu says, it doesn't work that way. God is not obligated to mankind ever to explain his dealings. Some things will be reserved for us when we go to glory. So the first thing is God does not have to explain himself. The second is the fact that God visits men in their affliction to rescue them from death. Now here's where the counseling element comes in. So Elihu is not debating with Job. Elihu is entering into the, the grace-filled words. And he's trying to help Job understand with what he says in verses 14 to 22. For man speaks once, yet twice, and yet man does not perceive it. How does God speak? 
In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men and is slumbering upon the bed, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from him. So there is the objective of God when he, as point two says, he visits men to rescue them from death. And he will use some form of chastisement and or a direct speaking to him to be able to do it. He withdraw that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. That's mercy. God doesn't want any one of his people to perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's New Testament theology in a shadow form that is given to us by Elihu. God is rescuing. God is saving. He's rescuing the perishing. But it was a limited method of being able to do it in Elihu's day. And rather than telling Job, listen, you're a sinner and you're doomed, man. You got to get your life right. Confess to God what it was. He's walking him through this journey. He said, there's a good possibility, Job, that you're, you're being visited by God because God is trying to spare your life. Now, it implies immediately that there may have been sin in the man's life, but he's not accusing Job of sin. He wants Job to see it for himself. Verse 19, is chastised and pain upon his bed and the multitude of his bones with strong pain so that his life abhors bread and his soul dainty meat. His flesh is consumed away that it cannot be seen and his bones that they seen stick out. Yea, his soul draws near onto the grave and his life to the destroyers. You know, I think he just described Job. He's sitting there looking at him and he says, your bones are sticking out that never showed before. Job said himself, I, hate, I, I despise good food. I cannot eat. I am hungered. I am near the brink of death. And there's this suffering. I abhor bread. All the things that Elihu pointed out, Job had already said. So Elihu, having been a patient man with gathering all the whole story before he speaks, so he's not a fool, takes into consideration. Now, here is biblical counseling. You gather data. And Elihu's gathering the data from Job. And he hears, you don't like to eat? You're not feeling well? Your flesh is rotting? Let me bring this into perspective. There are times when God visits men because he wants to prevent them from the grave, from dying, from the final outcome of chastisement. And so, as we learn, he visits them either by in a dream when they are in a deep sleep. And by the way, that's not foreign language. Remember in Genesis chapter 20 when Abram and it takes his wife and they're going into a foreign country. There was the king of Bimelech and Abram says, look, tell him you're my sister. So goes that transaction. She goes with king of Bimelech and guess who visits Abimelech, this pagan king in the middle of the night. God speaks to him in a dream. He says, don't touch that girl. That's not your wife. That belongs to Abraham. Abimelech gets up immediately the next day. So what we have is a situation that I know you is describing to us here where Abimelech Here's God in a dream, responds to the dream, gives the man's wife back to him, and spares his own life. It happened also in Genesis chapter 15 with a Pharaoh. Same scenario. And, and Pharaoh gets word from God, that's not his sister, that's really his wife. In both of those situations, those men responded in the right way to the vision, the dream that would God would give to them. Why? To prevent them from imminent death. That is God's mercy. Elihu was God's messenger of grace, his messenger of mercy. And Elihu is using the words that fit into the context of Job's life. Our third observation, he provides another to show him how to live right. Look at verse 23. And if there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand to show unto man his uprightness. That sounds like Elihu. He's simply describing the ways in which God live, works for his people. And he says sometimes he will deliberately send a messenger. And you just cannot help but think that rather than Elihu sending or saying, listen, I'm a messenger from God, he gives it to him the way that it works on the norm. And hopefully Job is going to see, 
You're the messenger from God. Why? You've just explained to me how to live right. And that is the, the idea of verse 23. <clears throat> One among a thousand. To show unto man his uprightness. Now, it either means that uh, what he is to do, how to get his life right, or what it is to be truly righteous. Either way, this messenger is sent by God. And then listen to the next one. He provides a substitute for his sin. Somebody else to suffer the consequence of sin. Here is a forecast of the gospel. I want you to understand that these men were not in the dark ages. These men lived in a time they understood what it meant to be saved. They were still being saved by faith. They still understood the necessity of an atonement. That was taught by Adam and Eve. Then it was passed on through the flood. It came out with Noah. And then everybody else, there would be this model of salvation, this model of redemption. And there would always be the shedding of blood if there was going to be the remission of sin. And in a very concise, pithy statement, Elihu brings this to Job's attention. Verse 24, then he is gracious unto him and says, deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. And that word ransom may be interpreted in some of your Bibles as an atonement, a covering for his sin. His flesh shall be fresher than a child. He shall return to the days of his youth. Speaking to a sick, dying, rotting man. God provides a substitute for your sin. It's, it's a portrayal, a picture of Jesus Christ who would take upon himself all of our sin. And that message comes to people by a messenger with the words of the gospel and, and by a messenger that says, God has a ransom. He paid the price to deliver your soul from darkness and to be made new, fresh, like a child. Now, in literal language, this is for Job's benefit, but in figurative language, we are born again. We start off new. We have a new heart. We are a new creation in Jesus Christ. And so here is an allusion to the gospel of the New Testament. You say, how can you see that? Because the language is there in just very short, rich, filled words. He shall pray unto him. So our next one is this. He not only does he provide a substitute, but number five, God calls for and hears the prayers of repentant hearts. He shall pray unto God and will be favorable unto him and he shall see his face with joy. So he render unto man his righteousness. Isn't that just fascinating? It's a prayer of faith and repentance. Or might we put in the right order, it's a prayer of repentance and faith. He looks on men, and, they, and he looks upon men, verse 27, and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. Lo, all these things works God, oftentimes with men. Elihu, words of grace. The gospel message. You want to be saved. Job, do you want to be rescued? I'm not going to sit here and pick your life apart. I'm giving you the, the Old Testament version of 2 Corinthians 10, 13, that God will not allow any man to go above what he's able to bear. That's where Job was at. But will, with the suffering and with the trial and the temptation, provide that way of escape. Elihu enters into the scene out of God's mercy and kindness to deliver Job from total despair and giving up. He also would give to us Hebrews 4 and verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, where we can find grace and mercy and help in our time of need. Why do we go there? Because we have the new and living way provided for us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Both of those New Testament passages apply to this counseling setting with Elihu and Job. Words filled with mercy, truth, an invitation for repentance and to call upon the name of the Lord and to be rescued. And I will deliver him. There was no other form of deliverance. And so Elihu kindly, biblically, with a great theology about God, speaks to Job. Let's look at the, the last one, and, and that is this. 
the providential care that God provides in their time of need. Very obvious, just let me mention them to you. You see, God always provides a faithful servant. Somebody, and be alert when you're, when you're in dire straits, life is rough, turned upside down, whatever it is, whatever the level might be, be on the lookout that God is going to send into your life a messenger with the words of grace, words of comfort, words of hope. Here's our suffering servant, and here is a faithful man, Elihu, that does three things. He, first off, he was faithful to the spirit that was within him. He knew God was speaking to his heart that you maintain your manners, hold your tongue, wisdom comes from God. Elihu, you know all of that. Do not speak until you are given the opportunity. Maintain that, but at the same time, do not back out of it. And so he was faithful to that spirit within him, found in chapter 32 and verse 8. And he says, but there is a spirit in man and the inspiration of the Almighty, which gives them understanding. When you go down to the end of that chapter, he says, I, I'm, I'm full of matter. The spirit within me constrains me, as Paul would say of the gospel. I am constrained to speak and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Moving within him was the necessity to give hope and help to an individual in time of need. Elihu was faithful messenger of God to a, self, a suffering servant. God provides that kind of care, the providential care that provides grace in our time of need. Secondly, he was faithful in the use of divine revelation from God. None of this just came off the top of his head. You can verify all of Elihu's words somewhere else in the Bible. A lot of it found in the New Testament. But when Elihu spoke, he spoke and related to what he had learned from God, whether it be from visions or from dreams or what he was taught by his parents. But he maintained the integrity of the word of God. He did not change it to fit a cultural setting or a man's life or for his own purposes. And so he is faithful to the use of revelation from God. A servant of God with words of grace and comfort must be faithful to the use of the scriptures. Hold on to that word and speak the truth in love. And if you're not sure how that works, read the story again. Third, he is faithful in providing the way of escape. And that's what these last several verses were all about. He looks upon men, if any say, I have sinned. He sends a messenger, and the messenger says, here's your way out. God is going to give you new flesh, new bones. You'll be a restored man. And when we read the balance of the book in the closing chapters, everything was restored to Job fourfold. Because Elihu was faithful, and he was faithful in providing the way of escape that is exactly what Job needed. Give you three thoughts to take home. I realize you got a lot to take home, but if we want to try and summarize it with three things that probably will hang on, you can hang your hat on this. Number one, God honors and will use people of humble spirits and biblical manners. Why do I say biblical manners? The whole story begins with a man who honored mannerism. Respect for the elders. Don't speak until you got the whole story. Wisdom comes from God. Those are three very critical, essential uh, characteristics that to be inculcated into our thinking today. And God will use it. And he had a humble spirit. He said, you are old. I am young. I dare not speak. He took the second step down. He waited for the opportunity. And when he did speak, he didn't speak. He didn't speak to impress any of those men. Remember the closing words of chapter 32? I'm not going to speak and give anybody a title. I will speak that which is on my heart. And we know what he spoke because he was faithful to that divine inspiration. Secondly, when we endure affliction, listen to the words of grace from another believer. Sometimes we receive the word and we kind of like it just water off of a duck's back or a Labrador retriever. We hear it, but we don't hear it. We don't receive it. So Job was in a position to be able to receive. Elihu was the man sent. So when we are enduring affliction, Wait for, look for, listen to an individual that very well could be sent from God. He has biblical answers, and he provides words of hope or the way of escape. 
Thirdly, to be able to be ready to answer, to be there should God call you to be that servant of grace. So there's two things. Know the word of God so that you know what words to say. And then also be ready. God could be asking you to be the minister of mercy to an individual that needs it. And you may not even know it. We, we're, we're not a transparent people in the 21st century. Not at all. But in our conversations, we can mine out and listen for those things that speak of hardship. Key words. Be sensitive to that. And then in the being able to answer that with appropriate words. But be sensitive to the Spirit of God prompting to be that messenger of grace. God has the words. He'll give you the words. But he needs messengers as we minister to one another or minister the gospel to one that is without Jesus Christ. And we have a, a story given to us here. Father, we would pray that today in all of our uh, listening to the scriptures and this uh, uh, attention that is resolved by Elihu, this man that you called to be able to speak, we ask that uh, his words would be of comfort to us, knowing that you are a God of grace and mercy. The Father, should there be someone in this auditorium here today that uh, might be, in a sense, in that Job condition, lost and undone, suffering from the effect of guilt and sin and not having to be able to put your finger on it, not having an answer, you provide the answer through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. I ask that you would make that possible for, with deep conviction, and that there would be a response to that invitation to be saved, to, to commit to Jesus Christ. We ask and we pray these things in his precious name. Amen.